warm welcome to you and thank you for joining me in this online worship service today. I trust that the next few moments reflecting on the word of the Lord will be a blessing to us all and my sincere prayer is that you will experience the healing and restoring presence of the Lord in today's message. In Isaiah 60 verse 1 to 3 we read the following. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. May our Heavenly Father's radiant light fall on us and enlighten our minds today so that we can understand His heart and His vision for our lives. Being in His transforming presence is a privilege and a humbling experience. And therefore I greet you in the wonderful name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in singing the following worship song and let us glorify the name of our Lord. Of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with only thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set for all that you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings yeah this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear Bear my cross. 
that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. Friends, the theme we will be reflecting on today is chosen and appointed. And we will be reading a few verses from John chapter 15. But before we open the word, let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us ask the Lord to open our hearts. Let us pray. Dear God, we humble ourselves before you and we come to you with a longing and a thirst that only you can satisfy and quench. We thank you for the opportunity of opening your word once again with expectancy. We know that it is a living and dynamic word which not only enriches our souls, but also gives us direction and purpose and meaning in this life. We ask your spirit to meet us now and to touch our hearts so that we can be transformed and reflect your image. Bless us with a boldness to follow in your footsteps and to do your will. We pray this in your glorious name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We read from John chapter 15 from verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Now that concludes our reading. May the Holy Spirit bless the word in our hearts today. Friends, I'm sure that you have noticed that Jesus' disciples were very different kinds of people. Very different to say the least. Let's just say that the only thing that held them together was Jesus. And other than that, they would have been perpetually at odds and I suspect often were. Otherwise, Jesus would not have had to keep emphasizing the scripture we read today about loving each other. Now, Peter also called the rock, he could be impulsive and forceful, impetuous and sometimes belligerent. And while Jesus would have valued these qualities as he knew they would be important for Peter's ability to endure the challenges of opposition in the days of the early church, still it seems Jesus struggled sometimes to keep Peter in check and on task. Peter could be prone to doubts. One minute he was loyal and faithful, and the next doubting and denying, loud and often challenging to Jesus, and still Jesus named him his right-hand man. Now Andrew, Peter's brother, also a fisherman, was nevertheless quiet and tended to stay out of the front lines. Jesus knew he had a good heart, but he tended to want to spend his time studying and learning, rather than fighting and leading. James was one of the sons of the fishing mogul Zebediah, and along with his brother John, they were called by Jesus the sons of thunder for their boisterous, loud, raucous language and behavior. They were used to the rough underbelly of the fishing industry. They tended toward uncultural behavior and spontaneous outbursts of emotion and opinion. You always knew what they were thinking. Their fiery temperaments may have made them zealous about the mission, but rough around the edges in dealing with people. 
Now, on the other hand, Philip and his friend Nathaniel were studious and theologically focused. They were avid students of the Torah and powerful preachers in the early church, the intellectuals of the group. They were interested in change, but they tended to go about it in a quieter, more organized way, supporting Jesus' teaching and doing what needed to be done. They were the more traditional students of Rabbi Jesus. Now, Matthew had been a customs official in Capernaum Harbor, and he worked for Rome. So he taxed, imported, and exported goods, and he was a seasoned politician, but was despised by the Jewish community for working for the enemy. But Matthew was also a good negotiator, a communicator, and he had an analytical mind. But he was stuck in a job he didn't like working for because those people didn't respect him. He longed for meaning and for change, belonging and identity. And Jesus gave him the opportunity to do something with his life that would make a real difference. Thomas was the rational mind of the group. He was a skeptic, but also the calm one in the face of trouble. He could be courageous and daring when he believed in something, but also would ask the right questions and seek answers before making decisions. Thomas needed to buy in in order to be convinced that something was worth doing. His steady, scientific-style mind would be needed in the midst of some of the more impulsive emotional moments exhibited by his fellow disciples. So faith was a bit more challenging to him, but once committed, he was all in. James, on the other hand, was a quiet, a follower. So quiet, we hear little about him. Simon was a zealot and a revolutionary, eclipsed by his fishermen brothers, and nevertheless he was interested in overthrowing Rome, and his political sense drove his sense of mission. Thaddeus was also a fairly quiet, gentle-hearted, and cared about people. He admired Jesus' heart for the unsupported and the marginalized, and he was an advocate for healing and mercy. He listened avidly to Jesus' teachings, and he was in awe of his healing ministry. Judas could be mercurial and had strong opinions about everything. He was an insider, and he understood the temple system. He had colleagues within, but yet hoped that Jesus would reform this system make waves and instigate change. He was all for having a political position in this new order. The financial treasurer of the movement, he was organized and savvy, but also could be untrustworthy and underhanded with the funds. He protected himself above others and could easily switch sides if he felt it in his own interests. The wild card in the bunch. He was loyal to Jesus, until Jesus challenged his sense of direction and the way he thought things should be handled. Then he took over and he went his own way. I wonder if you recognize any of these personalities. You see, every church has at least some of them. So why on earth would Jesus choose such diverse and controversial personalities as his disciples and inner circle? You see, because in order for Jesus' mission to be successful, he would need to prove that this prime directive worked. And what was his prime directive? To love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. Bear fruit together. Jesus said this over and over and over again. But why did he say that? Because it had, to be, had been hard to do. How would he get such different personalities with such different hopes and dreams and reasons for following him to work together for the good of the mission when their only common factor was him? How would they continue to do so after he was gone? Love one another, he said. Enough to lay down your life for each other. Enough to be in mission together. Keep your eyes on what needs to be done. Enough to show the world that being my disciple means that even the most diverse and at odds people 
can be in community together and work for the common good. Show the world that this works. Jesus, in his very inner team, in his choice of trusted right hands, would challenge the world and its workings, the divisions of his time, the biases and the isms of his time, by creating the most effective, loyal and unstoppable team in history, made up of the most diverse and unlikely individuals he could find. And they proved him right. So you see, a good team is not about being at the same mind and doing the same things. It's not about agreeing on everything or having like personalities. It's about loving one another, respecting each other's differences and unique take on life and the mission. Most of all, respecting each other's faith in the one thing that matters, Jesus resurrected and ready to change the world, one team at a time. Jesus didn't put out a call for a disciple sign up. He didn't interview disciples for certain kinds of qualities. He didn't demand that they conform to certain kinds of standards. He allowed them to be who they were, even to the last moment. And he encouraged them to use their unique personalities and gifts to make a difference in the ways they could. Their qualities were all different, but united. They could rely on each other to balance each other's strengths and weaknesses. They each had a role to play and a way to be involved in the mission. They each found their own way of doing that in Jesus' lifetime and in the years of the early church. They worked because they were all focused on something bigger than themselves, bigger than their differences, the mission of Jesus Christ. The famous preacher Max Lucado once told an interesting story about a group of men who went on a fishing trip. And when it rained, they were all stuck inside their trailer with nothing to do. And as a result, they began sniping at each other, critiquing each other, lashing out in tempers and feeling grouchy. His verdict? When fishermen don't fish, they fight. Disciples in mission are focused on the mission. But disciples who are not focused on the mission will focus on their differences. In our scripture reading for today, Jesus tells us, You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. Be united in your mission, Jesus tells them. I chose and appointed you to carry on the mission I have started, to change the world, to heal the sick and the doubting, to proclaim God's sovereignty and his saving grace, to let people know they are beautiful exactly the way they are, in all of their differences and diversity, to be the example of what the world can look like when people work together towards a common good. If you love the parent, you love the child. John tells us in his letter, As the Father loved me, so I love you, said Jesus. So we are all adopted sons and daughters of God, said the Apostle Paul. These are messages that assure us that being part of the family of God has nothing to do with genealogy or culture or type or even blood DNA, but everything to do with sisterhood and brotherhood and the beauty of God's creation. In the end, it all comes down to love. Love for God, love for each other, and to believe in a mission that upholds and initiates this kind of loving. So the question is, who are your brothers and sisters? Who are your neighbors? It's everyone. Not just the people in your neighborhoods, not just the people in your buildings, and not just the people you know, but everyone. You are all sons and daughters of God. And the more we see the world this way, the more loving and beautiful the world will become. Amen.
Let us pray. Father, thank you for revealing your heart to us today through scripture and this message. Thank you for reaffirming to us that you use ordinary people like the fishermen long ago and that you look past our inabilities and shortcomings. Help us to love our neighbor with the same love that you have expressed. Help us to serve one another and be agents of hope and love and peace. In your hands, our lives have meaning and purpose. Thank you for equipping us and making us partners in the building of your Father's kingdom. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our friends, we constantly remind ourselves in the congregation that we are blessed to be a blessing to others. Through the provision of the Lord and the contributions of willing people who believe in our ministry, we are able to make a difference in the lives of the most vulnerable and elderly people in our community. Our offering is therefore also a thankful reminder that God provides enough for his children. And if you would like to make a contribution to our ministry, you are welcome to do so by following the instructions that will follow on the screen. Friends, that conclude our worship service. May you experience a blessed week and may you make a difference in the Lord's kingdom in the coming week. Let us receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.